Much gets made of how modern life can make us miserable, too stressful, too sedentary, too many people packed into an urban jungle. Yet all too often, people feeling socially isolated even in a crowd. As unpleasant as all that can be, neuroscience has begun to find that these complaints aren't just social or cultural problems, but that they're also biological problems. And joining us now for more on that, in Chicago, Illinois, Dr. John Cassiopo. He is director of the Center for Cognitive and Social Neuroscience at the University of Chicago. And with us here in studio, Dr. Mark Berman. He is adjunct scientist at Baycrest's Rotman Research Institute. And Dr. Martin Ralph. He is director at the Center for Biological Timing and Cognition at the University of Toronto. And we thank the three of you for joining us, both here in the studio and in Chicago, Illinois. John, good to have you on the line from there. And I'll start with you because I suspect most of us think of loneliness as a social problem, but your research suggests that it's much more than that. Explain if you would. We looked at uh, the unpleasantness of loneliness as uh, a biological signal. It's an aversive cue that suggests uh, a need to change one's behavior. Um, physical pain is an aversive state that helps you take care of your physical body. People born without that are at danger for injuring themselves and not knowing it. The aversiveness of loneliness is a social pain that helps you take care of your social body, which you also need to survive and prosper uh, in, in the world. So that's how we've looked at it. We've looked at the biological consequences of loneliness and have uh, found quite a large number, both in human and non-human social species. Non-human as well. How, how do you know? Well, we've done, we have an animal model. Uh, it's a rhesus monkey model, but we've also reviewed the literature all the way down to invertebrates. And many of the uh, physiological effects that we find in humans, we see in uh, other non-human animals. Hmm. So subjective psychological states can turn out to have a biological impact on people. That, that sounds new to me. Is that? Uh, when we started doing research on this a couple decades ago, loneliness was thought to be little different than depression or shyness. And we have found uh, that not to be the case, and in fact that uh, it serves a very useful purpose for us, just like physical pain does in terms of cueing us to things that are important for our genetic legacy, for what it takes for us to survive and prosper. Uh, among the physiological consequences are increased uh, cortisol, uh, a very strong, uh, powerful stress hormone system called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical axis is ramped up when one feels isolated, uh, and this serves to help protect one in those conditions of uh, special threat. Okay, let me review that with you again, make sure I've got it here. So you would, you would say that loneliness is one of the ways in which our brain, perhaps without our conscious mind even knowing it or being involved, tries to take care of our body? That's exactly right. And in fact, you're correct to emphasize that we don't have to be aware of it. Uh, we've done tests uh, uh, that involve um, tapping aspects of information processing of which you're unaware. It's called the Stroop test. And we find that negative social words actually uh, garner more attention even when you're unaware of the content of the word. A little bit like when you're hungry, you might notice the golden arches jumping out at you. When you feel lonely, you notice social threats jumping out at you, even when sometimes they're not real threats. Is there any way to know whether or not this is a phenomenon which is more prevalent in modern times as opposed to decades ago? We really can't uh, know that without empirical research, but what we have found just in the last 10 or 15 years is an increase in the level of loneliness in the United States. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, it was estimated to be about 20%. There are now two surveys, national surveys, one of which was ours, one another group in California, that suggest it's creeping closer to 40% now. So there does seem to be an increase in feelings of isolated living. We know that to be the case demographically. It seems to also be impacting people's perceptions. Hmm. Okay, Mark Berman, let me get you involved at this point. How much do our brains like the concrete jungles that we seem to be increasingly inhabiting? Well, uh, from our research, it suggests that they don't like them very much. Um, and to be a little bit more specific, um, in our research, we're interested in looking at how physical environments, how the physical environments affect memory and attention and things like that. So in our research, we find that when people go on a 50-minute walk in nature, a walk in a local park, they show about a 20% improvement in short-term memory capacity, while walking through uh, a heavy urban environment, uh, they show none of those benefits. 
Uh, this is regardless of age demographic? Regardless of age demographic. Um, in fact, uh, even uh, psychopathology doesn't have an impact either. So it's interesting listening to John talking about loneliness. Uh, we did the same study with people with clinical depression and had them go for the walk alone. And we weren't sure what kind of effects we would find, because you might imagine that if you go for a walk alone, you might begin to start ruminating and perseverating. But we actually found Sorry, perseverating? perseverating, which means uh, kind of just um, continuously thinking about negative thoughts and feelings over and over again. When we found that when we did the same study, had people with clinical depression go on the walk in the park versus the walk in the urban environment, they showed effects that were five times stronger than our non-clinical sample, um, indicating that these had huge these walks in nature had huge benefits for people diagnosed with clinical depression. One more follow up here. You say five times stronger. What's the metric you're actually looking at that allows you to measure whatever this is? It's sort of it's a statistical term, uh, sort of the the power of the effect. So the effect size uh, was five times stronger. Do you know why our brains appear to prefer? nature as opposed to concrete jungles? It's, a, it's an open question. So we have some hypotheses. Um, one of the hypotheses that we're working under uh, is called attention restoration theory, which basically talks about attention as coming in two forms or two kinds. Uh, one kind is called directed attention, and that's the kind of attention that we use uh, in our daily work where you as an individual person are focusing your attention on something specific. Um, and it's thought that that kind of attention is depletable or, or fatigable. So you can only focus your attention for so long before you get too tired out and you need a break. That's counter to another uh, kind of attention that we call involuntary attention, or sometimes it's referred to as bottom-up attention, and that's the kind of attention that's activated by inherently interesting stimulation in the environment. So the idea that we think why nature is restorative is that typic in typical nature environments, uh, you don't have to use directed attention a lot. You don't have to worry about getting hit by a car or something like that. Mm -hmm. While at the same time, there's a lot of um, interesting stimulation in natural environments that sort of activates this involuntary attention while at the same time resting the directed attention. So we think that's, that's why it might be restored. Well, you don't have to worry about hitting, getting hit by a car, but you might have to worry about getting eaten by a bear. That's true. So uh, I think if we would have done the same studies, having people walk on a cliff that had a very big drop off, I don't think we would have gotten those benefits. <laughs> if we had people walk at night, I don't think we would have gotten exactly. those benefits okay. either. OK, good point, good point. All right, uh, Martin Raff, let me get you in at this point, put you to work here. It actually, in the grand scheme of history, hasn't been that long mm -hmm. since we have had electricity and been able to control, uh, basically been able to um, decide that just because it's dark outside doesn't mean it has to be dark inside. Uh, a lot of people now live in, if not a 24-7 world, uh, certainly a, an elongated day. How smoothly have our bodies and brains made that transition? Um, <clears throat> I think there are probably two levels of answer to that. One, one is this um, answering in terms of the ancient clocks that control us, that are, that are linked to uh, regular cycles in the natural environment. And ancient clocks being sun and moon? Uh, ancient clocks within the, the living thing, ah, okay. linked to the, the, the physical world, which is the rotation of the earth and the revolution of the moon. Um, and then there are other clocks that sort of take care of us in the short term that can be set by events that happen that we need to remember or we need to predict. In the end, what biology is doing is allowing us to predict what's going to happen in our environment. Good things, bad things, this, it's hard to put a value on them. Sometimes in the lab we use big bad things or big good things. But in nature, in, especially in, in our environments, we are interacting with decisions that we make every moment, every step that we take down the shopping mall, for example, we, we, we're attracted toward this, toward something else. All of this is integrated into a system that allows us to move ahead and, and predict what's going to happen to us. The clocks, the, the, the things that I'm interested in, are rather regular. These are assumptions that are made biologically that things are going to happen at regular intervals. So we have this central clock that is tied to light and dark primarily that is operating our entire lives. And then we have these other oscillators that 
pay attention to the timing of events like something good to eat that we find in the road or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then cause us to anticipate these things happening the next day. And when you think about it, the only interval that you could reasonably use to anticipate the same event happening again is 24 hours. So now we have this collection of clocks that tell us what's going to happen. We don't think about them. It's not a conscious thought that it's think something's going to happen at 2 o'clock. But our body gets ready for for these things to happen. Whether or not they happen is irrelevant. The body tell, gets ready for tell, it. Tell us what a circadian rhythm is. Okay, a circadian rhythm by definition is circa dies. It's uh, about a day. And it's, it's one of a handful of biological clocks that mimic or reflect the uh, regular cycles of the outside world. So 24 is a circadian, or approximately 24 about 365 it would be a circannual rhythm. So what these clocks do is allow us to organize our internal physiology, link it with our behavior, and then bring in the connection or the anticipation of uh, the important things that are going to happen outside. And presumably when you mess with your circadian rhythm, you're not going to get enough sleep and off to the races you go. That's one of a number of things that can happen. The, the obvious one, I think, is that if, you, if your clock is set wrong, you're not going to be in touch with the outside world. The other thing is that we have this milieu of clocks. All the organs are talking to each other. They're all anticipating the demand on the organ. When, our, that, when that, in, that uh, hierarchy is disturbed, then we get sick. And if it's disturbed for long enough, we end up with chronic disease. Hmm. Let's go back to Chicago on that one. John, have we paid enough attention to the relationship between the brain and the body over the years? Well, I think clearly not. Um, if you look at the largest causes of morbidity and mortality uh, in industrialized societies, uh, they now fall at uh, the feet of chronic diseases that have very strong behavioral and social antecedents and, and influences. Uh, and that's in part because we've assumed diseases were either germ-based or organ-based rather than orchestrated by the brain. And many of the chronic diseases have very strong uh, central nervous system or brain influences on them. So that's it's actually completely counter to what we've been taught ever since we were little kids, which is stay away from the germs and you'll be okay. In fact, it's a lot, have I got this right, uh, John Cassiope? It's a lot uh, more complicated than that. It's a lot more complicated. One of the uh, publications we uh, did recently was on uh, mortality in a nationally representative sample here in the United States. And people's loneliness in 2002 predicted in this older adult sample how many had died by 2008. And that was net demographic factors and their objective social circumstance and even their health behaviors. Uh, it was above and beyond all of those uh, standard risk factors that one might anticipate. Hmm. So Mark Berman, is it, a wrong, is it a mistake for us to flock to cities? <laughs> As we clearly are and have been for 100 years. I think that would be overly simplistic. I think what our research is showing, I mean, if we, if we all moved out into the country, we'd be destroying the nature, the very nature that, that we've been talking about is beneficial. So I think the way to move forward is to try to incorporate natural elements into the city, to try to make the cities more, more livable, um, to promote better health and, and things like that. So more parks for sure. Definitely more parks. More green space um, and more cities More green space. Health. But it, it, you know, it, we need more research to actually understand what it is about nature that's leading to these benefits. Once we understand what it is about nature that leads to the benefits, then we can design spaces that sort of optimally uh, improve human functioning. But it sounds like our modern brains aren't jiving with what our ancient brains clearly want. Is that right? Well, I, you know, modern society is creating technologies and things that are maybe not jiving with our ancient brains. I mean, if you think about advertising, um, advertisers are capitalizing on our ancient brains. You know, they're eye-catching, they demand our attention, uh, which is going to be taxing and fatiguing. Uh, so if you're, if you're going through an environment where there are things in the environment that are designed to sort of capture your attention and tax you, uh, that might hurt 
uh, functioning to some extent. Martin Ruff, can you speak yeah. to that? Or are, are well, I'm, I'm going to agree with Mark on, on, okay. on that one. I, I, I think that w what is happening, uh, maybe we should back up and ask people why, ask, ask why people flock to the cities, if that's indeed true. Um, the, 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 the reason that people do that, there, there, there are, you know, there's a set of reasons why anyone would go to a city, and one is a social thing, getting work, getting services, whatever that, those reasons might be. They all have something in common, and that is that the people who are doing this behavior are getting something that they need. There's something attractive, something attractive about a big, dark city as much as a fruitcake if you like fruitcake, I guess. But, um, but people do that for a reason. And um, anyone who is uh, promoting new technology, anyone who's promoting anything that, that they want to give or sell is going to know that if they're any good at doing that, that sort of work. And so there's an attraction to the cities, right? And, and it has a lot to do with maintaining yourself the, the, the person, the health, the, 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 the uh, possibility of prosperity, anything like that. Um, and uh, I, I think that if, if we understood why people are doing that, um, in fact, maybe we do understand why people are doing that, but if we paid attention to that, we could build the cities the way Mark is, is saying, that, uh, you know, make them attractive to people, but at the same time healthier. Well, let me pick up on that with John Cassiopo in Chicago, which is uh, our, brain, our ancient brains and our modern brains may be working across purposes here, and yet somehow we've still managed to increase life expectancy by about 20 years, I think, over the past 100 years. So what's the explanation for that? Well, I think one of the reasons we're seeing chronic diseases now emerge as uh, a major cause of morbidity and mortality is that we're living longer. Uh, when life expectancy was in the 30s, chronic diseases, these breakdown of these homeostatic mechanisms like blood pressure regulation or blood sugar regulation weren't a problem because we perished before those mechanisms degraded. Uh, so with longevity come new sources of, of uh, health disorders, distress, and mortality. So that's partly what's going on. I think though, in, in uh, following up with your discussion, um, the brain is trying to adapt to these new environments. Um, if you look at Facebook or social networking, we are developing new technologies all the time, and some that touch with our ancient nature are particularly popular. There's a reason why Facebook and Twitter have risen so quickly. Uh, now, it's not that that's a good or a bad tool. It's really how is it used. If this is a tool that's designed and used to promote welfare, uh, then it's to the net good. And, and it seems that if you use it to leverage face-to-face -face contacts, it's actually something that's healthy. It's when it's used as a destination point instead of a way station, when you don't get out and actually interact with people. Instead, you stand behind your computer and only interact online. That's when the deleterious effects of even online communication seem to emerge. Hmm. John, how so long how have you been using these technologies? Sure. How long have you been studying the brain? Uh, about 40 years now. 40 years, and what percentage of what you want to know about the brain do you think you now understand? <laughs> uh, what, uh, what percent do I want to know? I, less than 1% of what I think we will understand in 100 years. I think we're just at the uh, threshold of really starting to understand the human brain. With all of what you know, after 40 years, do you think you still only understand 1% of what people will know a century from now? Is that right? Yes. Yes, I, and I, I would anticipate uh, my colleagues would agree with that statement. We're learning so much so rapidly. Uh, it makes you humble uh, in terms of how little we know. Mark, what would you put the percent at? I agree with John. I mean, the, 1%? The, the brain is the last frontier. I mean, it's so complex. Even we've just now just started to really develop the technologies to even study the brain. And those technologies are going to improve over time as well. So I think we're just scratching the surface. We're making good progress, but we're just scratching the surface. Where do you think the number is? I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know why you're asking the question. I'm asking the question. Why? Qu what, what percentage? Because I mean, if it's really an issue of, of um, trying to improve, in, improve people's lives, their health, their, their prosperity, and all of these things, we have a lot of answers already. I, I sometimes wonder 
whether we need to go to 2% of what, <laughs> what we ought to know, because we need really to know 100% in the end. And so why not take what we know right now and build, build on those few things that really can make a difference? Uh, like what? And, well, I'm saying that because I, cause I have a, you know, a, a sort of a bee in my bonnet about some of these things. One is that um, th there's, a, there's been a trend over the last few decades to, um, to move toward uh, more high-tech sort of devices yeah. in the home and things like that. Um, we know, for example, that um, uh, chronic diseases can be caused or exacerbated by disturbed rhythmicity, and we know that rhythm disturbance can occur by moving some of our uh, social activities deeper and deeper into the night and getting less sleep. But I'm not even sure what sleep has to do with it. Uh, the, the, the experiments that have been performed with, with uh, our model organisms tell us that, that um, life expectancy actually goes down as you uh, disturb rhythms and the chronic diseases go up. We can so create them. Le let me get John to follow up on this then. Would a good idea be turn your computer off, turn your television off, get everything off by 11 o'clock at night and have a good night's sleep? Um, not precisely. I, I'm <laughs> all in favor of getting a good night's sleep, but I think that um, it's really how you live your days when you get ready to turn in. One of the things that we have found is that people who feel isolated actually sleep more poorly at night. They show more micro-awakenings. We've shown that longitudinally as well, and it's net, uh, for instance, the effects of depression. Uh, so there's, some, there's a way in which you can live your life so that when you get ready for bed, you actually get more rest. It's more salubrious than the same amount of time uh, spent in bed sleeping if you've uh, led that day a little, more, uh, a little more dangerously or a little more disconnected from those around you. Hmm. Mark, what do you think the trick is, given the dichotomy we've described here between what the ancient brain is conceived to do and what the modern brain wants to do? I, again, I think it's striking a balance. I, I think a lot of the activities with using the computer, the cell phone, and things like that, I mean, they, it's this trade-off between production, sort of, and uh, what, you know, what our brains, the environments that our brains evolved in, right? Our, our, the environment that we live in now is very different from the environment that we evolved in. For sure. Um, so I think, again, it's sort of striking the balance, right? I mean, a lot of time, um, I think activities that we think are restful and good for our brains are not good for our brains. I mean, one example is um, we watch way too much television, far more television than, than is really good for us. That's really a terrible argument to, to be making right now, if you don't mind my saying. But what you meant to say was we don't watch enough good television. <laughs> that's, that's, right, yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. That's right. I knew you meant to say that. Yeah. Um, and you know, television is seen as a very restful activity, but it, it turns out that the more hours and hours that people report watching television, the more irritable they, they report being. Um, so I think, you know, why instead of watching television, why not go for a walk in a park for half an hour or something like that? And there's night? no question in your mind that it is the brain's engagement with that box that results in them being more agitated. That's, that's what I would put my money on. John Cassiopo, what's your view on that? I agree completely. That's what I mean by it's really what you've done before you lay down to get that night's rest. And the more natural way you can live your life, probably the healthier it is for you. I, I, at, the, at the risk of, uh, geez, I shouldn't do this, but here we go. I wear an iPod to bed every night. I want to hear programming as I'm falling asleep. <laughs> Is that really a stupid thing to do? In I mean, I think I get a good night's sleep, but I don't know. Mark, what do you think? I mean, you do a small experiment on yourself. Try, try sleeping without that and seeing uh, how your productivity is. Hmm. I can't imagine not going to sleep with it on, which is why I'm a little leery about trying this experiment. I mean, this is what's interesting about these technologies, that they, they are addictive. And typically, addictions aren't good for us, all right? So um, I think it's going to take a little bit of, of thinking in terms of getting some of these more healthier behaviors more in our routine. John, am I doing bad things to my brain by doing that? Not necessarily. I, I mean, again, these new technologies are allowing us to connect with ideas with principles uh, with other people in ways that were not available before. As long as those are leveraged and you end up with 
um, more face-to-face -face or more natural interactions. I mean, if you're listening to an iPod when you fall asleep and that makes you more productive and you're happier in that uh, workplace the next day, then the net effect may be to your benefit rather than to your detriment. Okay. I think it's an empirical question. I'm going with that. I like that answer. John Cassiopo, the director for the Center for Cognitive and Social Neuroscience at the University of Chicago. We thank you for being on the line for us there in the Windy City. And here in Toronto, Mark Berman, adjunct scientist at Baycrest Rotman Research Institute, and Martin Ralph, director at the Center for Biological Timing and Cognition at the U of T. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.